I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Linus Constantinus and to give us his presentation on the biomarkers on ADHD. Lovely to be in Dublin for this uh, for this presentation. And uh, some of you might have uh, already heard me speak on this subject. I, it was my first talk about this was more of an introduction. So don't worry if you haven't. This one will go a little bit more into biomarkers in ADHD. Uh, talk briefly about ADHD, its history, and then we talk about biomarkers in ADHD. I, I do have a, a special interest in using biomarkers in psychiatry. I am myself a clinical psychiatrist, and I am doing my uh, my postgraduate degree in precision medicine, which includes the possibility of using biomarkers. And we'll talk about what biomarkers are. Don't worry if you've never heard that word before. Uh, you're not to blame. <laughs> and uh, we'll talk about what they are and how we can use them in ADHD going forward in the future. Uh, so to look at the future, we'll have a look at the past. So if you go all the way to the 18th century, you have the first description of something that sounds a lot like ADHD by a German physician. And then in the 20th century, we have the first publication in a journal. And then by the 30s, we have the first name for it, hyperkinetic disorder, and the WHO later adopted that. And then in the USA, in the 30s, we have the first medication, amphetamines. And in the 60s, we have the other medication, methylphenidate. And then all the way, we're coming up to today, where we set diagnostic criteria based on evidence, and we try to predict treatment response, the clinical course, and to uh, kind of dig into the family history of the disorder. But now we're a new era is dawning, really, in, in, in medicine, where we aim to have reliable biomarkers that we can use to diagnose, categorize, and predict treatment response in disorders such as ADHD. So diagnosis, uh, most of you have, will have already heard about diagnosis of ADHD uh, and what it is. So we have developmentally inappropriate levels of hyperactive, impulsive, and or inattentive symptoms for six months in different settings, causing impairments in, in living, and they appear in early to mid-childhood, and they're explained best of all by ADHD and not another uh, disorder. And there's different types, primarily inattentive, hyperactive, impulsive, or the combined form, which combines the above two. But then we come to the actual diagnosis, it's not an easy task. Actually, it's a very challenging task. And a lot of people here or on the on or watching this will have personal experience from themselves or maybe uh, someone they know uh, and will know how difficult it is to actually get a diagnosis. Because the diagnosis, it's it, you need someone with experience, with an interest in HDHD, they're usually very busy. And even if you get into someone who's appropriate in diagnosing you with ADHD, they have a difficult task ahead because they will use a lot of different tools and combine them in the end to make the diagnosis. And that includes rating scales. And you can see a few rating scales here and uh, a, a, an interview with a patient, an interview with ideally the parents, looking at school reports, school records, Talking to teachers, it, it's, it, it is not an easy task. And as well, ADHD is also challenging because it's very highly comorbid. So a lot of people with ADHD will also suffer from other disorders. And we'll talk about that later. And even 100%, some studies estimate that 100% of people with ADHD have at least one other psychiatric disorder. Uh, the symptoms overlap with other disorders, and we'll talk about that as well and why that is. People with ADHD, especially if they come later in life, they have a lot of compensating skills. But, and, and that keeps, you know, it keeps the physicians on their toes, but it, it makes the diagnosis quite, quite difficult. There, every person is different and every person with ADHD is different. So there is heterogeneity. There's a, a, a varying presentation depending on each person. And that presentation can change. The person with HD won't have the same symptoms when they're six and when they're 60. And the diagnosis, as we said, is very complex and uses a lot of methods. So we need biomarkers. And we'll talk about biomarkers in a second, but 
I'll, I won't go into this because this is a series of talks, not even a talk. It's a series of talks that I could give, or, you know, a professional could give about what causes ADHD. But the short answer is genes cause ADHD and the way they interact with the environment cause, causes ADHD. So if you look at genetic, it is a polygenic disorder for most of people with ADHD. So many, many genes contribute a little bit and bit by bit that builds up to ADHD. Very rarely you have big single gene defects that cause ADHD, but that's the exception, not the rule. And then as we go to environment, we know that a lot of environmental causes are associated with ADHD. So that toxic toxicants such as lead, smoking while pregnant, valproate, organophosphates. And then again, in pregnancy, we know that preterm birth and low birth weight are associated with ADHD and as, as well as hypertension or preeclampsia and pregnancy of, of the mother is, is associated with ADHD. And adversity is associated with ADHD as well. So social causes as well, such as poverty and growing up in, in neglect can be associated with ADHD. So you've heard me say this word a lot of times, but I haven't explained what it is. So what is a biomarker? So it's kind of difficult to, to, to define, but a good definition that a lot of people agree on is that it's any characteristic that can be objectively measured and evaluated and can indicate normal biological processes or pathogenetic processes or responses pharmacologic to a therapy or other responses to a therapeutic intervention. Uh, so there is a consortium that came together and defined the ideal biomark for ADHD. And they said that it would have a diagnosis sensitivity of 80% for detecting ADHD. It would be specific at least 80% for distinguishing ADHD from other disorders that we, we will talk about that have symptoms that are very similar. And it would be reliable, reproducible, and it would be inexpensive to measure, non-invasive to the patient, and simple to perform. And it would be confirmed by, you know, some uh, studies, serious studies in peer-reviewed journals, by qualified people. And uh, this is no spoiler, we don't have such a biomarker. In fact, we don't have any biomarkers currently in clinical practice. But I'm going to talk about why that's challenging and, 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 and mention a few candidates that seem to be emerging from our studies. So we have here a study, uh, which is quite a big study. You can see it involved 50, it's, it's a systematic review which involved 53 other studies, 4,000 people with ADHD, 7,000 7, people without ADHD, and came up with more than 200 potential biomarkers. Uh, however, most of the biomarkers came up in one small study each. So I've included here a short list of those biomarkers that are, that appeared in, let's say, two studies at least. And those inclu included copper, and copper was found to be increased in people with ADHD. Uh, malondialdehyde, okay, so this is it's a little bit complicated, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a final product of the perioxidation of uh, polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids in the cell. And also mean platelet volume, this is something you can see in a, in a blood test, and zinc. These are the four biomarkers that out of all these thousands of people studied, and these are only candidates. And at the end of this big review, they came out with a disappointing result that we see at, at the end there. None of the biomarkers uh, had evidence of specificity and sensitivity of at least 80%, which we mentioned previously is what we're looking for. So they examined more than 200 potential biomarkers, but none of them lived up to that uh, promise. Uh, so I'm looking at another uh, systematic analysis here, which was broken up into three sections. The first section was looking at radiographic studies, electroencephalograms, magnetic resonance studies, and FNIRS, which FNIRS is a cup that you can wear on your head and, and it will measure the kind of, of blood oxygenation in different areas of the brain. So it's a very easy and non-invasive method uh, to do because we are talking about, uh, we mentioned that we want the biomarker to be non-invasive and we are talking about children in a lot of cases. So radiographic studies are a good option for us. 
you know, you can ask someone to go into an MRI, but even FNEOS is even easier. It's a functional near infrared uh, spectroscopy. It's even easier because it's just a cup you wear and you can move around and children with ADHD, they will want to move around. So it's, it, it's a kind of a pragmatic and, you know, uh, issue. And what did this show? 51 of those studies were included in this meta-analysis. What did they show? They showed that white matter radio diffusivity CVD of fewer white matter tracts were associated with symptom severity. So by giving people a scan, an MRI scan, they could predict who would have more severe symptoms and who would have less severe symptoms. So doing that early on can maybe give a picture of how someone's ADHD will, will proceed throughout their lives. And then they found some more, let's say, associations. So lower gray matter volume in the brain is associated with ADHD. And looking at the blood oxygenation, they found that reduced oxyhemoglobin signaling in the right inferior frontal gyrus, an area of the brain, was again associated with ADHD. So we have less activity in that area of the brain. That's why we have uh, this kind of less uh, metabolic activity there. And using then going into EEG, we have an event-related potential. This is kind of a measure of brain activity. And this specific event-related potential, P3B, again, was enhanced in ADHD. So this, this is what is coming out of these studies now uh, when it regards to radiographic studies. And they also looked at physiological studies. And this is quite interesting. Uh, very non-invasive, very easy to do, looking at the eye. So maybe none of you have ever heard, of, maybe some of you have never even thought that you can see if a person has ADHD or, you know, their degree or the severity of their symptoms through their eyes. But this is what 20 studies showed, that people with ADHD had large pupil diameters and low complexity and symmetry well, this is specifically talking about an eye test from, a, from an eye doctor. But it was also linked to weak eye virgins and microcycades, which are specific tiny movements that we make with our eyes. So giving people an eye test can help, you know, diagnose, perhaps diagnose with ADHD. And then they, they did some salivary studies and they found that ADHD was linked with lower salivary cortisol and high blood levels of, of pro-inflammatory markers. So they found inflammation of the blood and lower cortisol in the saliva. And even, I, th I think very interestingly, they showed that specific populations of uh, bacteria in the gut, B of Atus and S. stercoricanis, are positively correlated to ADHD symptoms. So they, the more of these bacteria they found in people's guts, the more severe ADHD symptoms they had. So I think this is very interesting. People are now starting to talk about the gut as a second brain. And so uh, this is probably an interesting uh, future direction for, for research, you know. And they also, this is the last, this is the third part of this. They looked at radiographic studies, physiological studies. They also looked at molecular studies. So looking at molecules associated in the body with ADHD. So we've known about the canurenin pathway and its various products and their association with ADHD. It's a, it's a metabolic pathway inside the body. So they found that increased canurenin and tryptophan and low anthranilic acid, these are all steps in this metabolic kind of pathway. They're all in, in associated with an increased risk of ADHD. And we, we know that also dopamine is and, and lack of dopamine kind of most simply, let's say, to put it simply, is associated with ADHD. And they found that methylation of the promoters uh, were associated with uh, developing ADHD. And then we have some genetic evidence that repeats in the, in the uh, promoter genotype was correlated with lower processing abilities, poor performance to focus in short-term memory and attention span. So this is looking at the genes and, and seeing that the more of these replications exist in the genes, they're related to the dopamine uh, promoter, the, the more severe the symptoms of ADHD would be. So this is not only diagnosing ADHD, this is more in the step of trying to predict 
their symptom severity. So perhaps even in the future, we're talking about categorizing ADHD according to severity of symptoms into different subtypes. And, 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 and of course, it is expect a spectrum, uh, as you have just said. So maybe this is more along realizing that it is a spectrum and we can categorize people along that spectrum. And this is a more promising summary of this meta-analysis compared to the previous one. This is a later one, actually. So it seems that we are improving. As they have said, there are several promising biomarkers that can be further researched in large cohort studies for an ADHD diagnosis. So I would like to spend the next bit of my talk talking about pharmacogenomics. So pharmacogenomics is the area where we look at genes and using that knowledge of, of genes, uh, we, we use that knowledge to guide our choice of medications. So why do we need to apply pharmacogenomics in ADHD? You might have heard that ADHD is very treatable by medicine. Actually, it's one of the medical disorders that is very, that has great results with medicine, with the medications. So why do we need to then look at the genes? Can we just give people the medication and, and leave it there? Well, no, because if, if you see what I, I have up on the slide, 40% uh, of people will respond to both amphetamines and methylphenidate, but one third almost, 28%, responds better to amphetamines, 16% responds better to methylphenidate, and 50% doesn't respond to either. So there's a big chunk of the population that will benefit from uh, a guided choice of medications, or the choice not to give medications, or the choice to give medications. So I've put up there a study uh, from uh, 2021 of 110 children, and they looked at the way the, the different areas of the brain connect to each other. And they found that uh, people that have uh, a, a stable connection between two areas of the brain, the singular percular connectivity, they called it in this study, which is a little bit of a technical term, uh, while they were developing, if their connectivity was the same as the control group, meaning people without HD, then uh, they will respond very well to both medications. So by looking at this area of the brain and the way that it develops and connects uh, to these areas of the brain, we can predict which people will respond very well to medications. So we know already that they are good candidates for medications, even in their childhood and in their developmental period. And now we'll talk a little bit about different medications and methylphenidate is a very common choice for ADHD. But how can we know, because if you remember the other slide, 16% respond better to methylphenidate and 28% respond better to amphetamines. So how do we choose or do we give randomly or no, we try and develop a method by which we choose candidates. So Kimedal, even if even almost 10 years ago, was using artificial intelligence or a form of artificial intelligence called machine learning. And they developed a machine learning model for predicting methylphenidate response. And they fed this model a lot of information you can see there. ADHD rating scales, other rating scales, Stroop color word test, fMRI scans, genetic information regarding, relating to the dopamine transporter genes, other energy receptor genes, blood, lead, and, and levels, uh, cotinin levels in the, in the urine. But once they fed all this information to this, let's say, artificial intelligence or machine, it could speed out and classify people into responders or non responders to methylphenidate with 85, almost 85% 85 uh, accuracy. So that clears the, you know, the test that we've said of 80% accuracy. Obviously, the practical difficulty is in gaining all this information. Not every person with ADHD has access to their genes, to, the, to functional MRI scans. So this is a research basis, but it's a good start in showing us that we can categorize people and we can't predict who will respond. So we don't need to put people through unnecessary medications, giving them medications that won't work. And again, in 2018, three years after the, the, the study that I've just talked about, 
a meta-analysis looked at 36 studies and they came out with five genes that might be able to predict response to methylphenidate. And they are related to norepinephrine transporters, adrenergic again transporters, uh, comped dopamine receptors and dopamine transporters. So these, we know that all these systems are involved in ADHD. So we are aware that these make sense as potential candidates for predicting uh, medication response. And again, another study found uh, genes that could be implicated not in response, but to whether people will have the negative side effects from methylphenidate. And again, you can see that the genes again involve uh, the dopamine uh, and, and all the other things that we talked about. But this could possibly predict whether a person treated with methylphenidate would have appetite reduction, skin picking, nail biting, tics, irritability, sadness. So we might even think about not only testing whether methylphenidate will achieve a therapeutic effect, but testing whether it would have unacceptable side effects. Because you don't want to give people a medication that will cause all this when you can avoid it. So you can choose the per you can match the medication to the person. That is the ideal matching medication to the person based on their specific circumstances. And amphetamine, obviously, very well known medication. Uh, the research is a little bit behind in 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 the um, pharmacogenomics of amphetamine, but we do have. I, I put up there is a few studies, and I put up one of them, a 2021 study, that found that specific COMPT variants were associated with improved uh, response for people with ADHD treated with amphetamine. So they could analyze that gene and, and, and choose the best candidates to take amphetamine. Atomoxidine, another uh, well-known and widely used medication, and this one even has an FDA-approved drug label uh, when it comes to pharmacogenomics, because it's metabolized in the liver by a specific enzyme, CYP2D6. And we know that people that don't metabolize atomoxidine very well will have higher levels of it. Okay, they might be, they might have a better response because they have high levels, but they also might have a lot of side effects and even, you know, uh, have uh, toxicity from it because they have such high levels. And, you know, even when the FDA says that you know, be careful because these people that don't metabolize this drug so well, you have to be careful with them. It means that we are already able to put this into, or we are very close to putting this into practice and looking at how people metabolize drugs before we give them to them. Okay, so I talked about pharmacogenomics and I mentioned in the beginning of my talk that uh, ADHD is related to a lot of other disorders, psychiatric disorders. Uh, but it's also related to other uh, issues that can occur throughout someone's lifetime and, and medical issues and, and social issues. Uh, and I, I just want to talk about a couple of studies that look at how those correlations occur through genetics. So there is a big genetic correlation with depressive disorder, major depressive disorder, autism spectrum disorder. Those are very strong. And there's also genetic correlations, but more modest with other disorders such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Uh, but it's also genetically correlated with uh, lower age at birth of first child, lower educational attain attainment, smoking, insomnia, and higher BMI. So if you look at all these and look at the recent studies coming out, it, they would suggest that there is a common mechanism underlying all this. A very good candidate is the do dopaminergic system and can, can explain ADHD and obesity, sleep problems, and even asthma and migraines, which are sometimes coexist with ADHD. So we have here a very important study published in Nature Genetics, a very respected journal by De Monti uh, five years ago. The discovery of the first genome-wide significant risk loss for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And they, they analyzed the genome of 55,000 people and they did a genome-wide association study, a GWAS. Uh, and what they found was 12 places in the genome that could, uh, uh, that could give you 
significant risk for, uh, for attention deficit for ADHD. So here, they also looked at the associations, and we can see the associations I mentioned previously. Uh, it's negatively associated with attainment academically. It's positively associated with depressive symptoms, major depressive disorder, higher BMI, extreme BMI, diabetes. Uh, it's positively associated with smoking, lung cancer. A, you know, a, it's negatively associated with predicted uh, life expectancy. So lower age of mothers age at death, lower age of fathers age at death, and overall parents age at death. And it's positively correlated with insomnia and even rheumatoid arthritis. And then the same uh, group just last year came out with another important study, genome-wide analysis of ADHD, and they identified 27 risk loci. They identified 12 in the previous study and 27 now. So every few years, our knowledge is, is improving in this area, and we're identifying more and more places in the genes that can give you a risk for, it, for ADHD. And out of those 27 places in the genome, they found 76 plausible risk genes. And, you know, they were not random genes. Actually, this set of genes uh, tended to be genes that were upregulated early, during early embryonic brain development, but also came up a lot in relation to cogn cognition-related uh, issues and reproduction-related issues. And they, they did another kind of uh, analysis, a transcriptome-wide association analysis related to their genome-wide. This is more technical, but it's a, it's a different study. But they identified, again, a lot of genes, 23 that were candidate genes, and eight of them in common with the uh, 76 mentioned previously. And they, this time they showed, and they did another, uh, the analysis showed that the genes that they found were expressed in the cortex of the brain, which is an area very highly associated with ADHD. And then they looked at the cell type, which cells, what kind of cells had these risk genes. And they found that they were re usually in dopaminergic, and again, dopamine comes up, uh, midbrain neurons. So this all makes sense that people that deal with ADHD, it, this all makes perfect sense. And here they, they kind of encapsulate the results and they found, you know, they, they talk that it's common in the frontal cortex, in the, in the midbrain and dopaminergic neurons, and they say that the findings for, for this fit well with the motor reward and executive function deficits associated with ADHD. The frontal cortex is involved in... Uh, executive functions, including attention and working memory. Mid-brain dopaminergic neurons are essential for controlling uh, key functions, such as voluntary movement, reward processing. So this all makes perfect sense. We are finding the areas of the brain that these genes are expressed in, the kinds of neurons that express these genes, and the genes behind the risk for ADHD. And Again, they, they studied this further for correlations. And again, they ended up in kind of the same results. Cognition uh, was related with ADHD, so, so lower educational attainment, weight, uh, higher mass body mass index, smoking, insomnia, age at first birth, and lower predicted longevity. And they looked at other psychiatric disorders. And again, Autism spectrum disorder, major depressive disorder are the ones that we talked about, but they also found cannabis use disorder was correlated with ADHD and uh, schizophrenia even. But of, 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 I think it's very important to see the last sentence there, which says that ADHD demonstrated the strongest genetic correlation with a low overall health rating. So people with ADHD very strongly tend to have a low overall health rating. You know, this is we need to pay attention to this. And I have some pretty pictures for you to look at. Uh, so these are Venn diagrams. They show the results for the uh, common gene variants shared between ADHD and other psychiatric disorders or other phenotypes. Uh, so you can see the kind of two overlapping pictures and the 
uh, and the overlap area is how many genetic variants they have in common. So autism spectrum disorder is the first picture on ADHD, a lot of ground in common, same with major depressive disorder, MDD, same with schizophrenia, same with high BMI, uh, uh, small INI, this is smoking in initiation, very common, a lot of common variants, insomnia, uh, and then negative correlation with uh, life expectancy and, and, and academic achievement. So we can see that, you know, we can explain why these disorders are related to ADHD by looking at the genes. And, and by looking at the genes and knowing that these genes are involved in the dopaminergic system and other important systems, we can even look at the underlying mechanism by which we have these uh, resulting pictures. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you for your attention during a little bit of a technical talk. Uh, I have here a picture of Cyprus for you. Uh, it's not to make you jealous, I promise. Uh, it's nice and sunny at 42 degrees uh, today, something like that. So thank you for your attention. And hopefully, uh, when, if I am told to present something similar in, in five or six or 10 years, I will be talking about actual uh, biomarkers in clinical practice because this is the actual hope. Thank you so much. Coming up directly now will be uh, Abby Robinson, who's a PhD candidate in DCU. Um, she was doing some research on ADHD and it's not giving anything away in terms of uh, a trailer or a spoiler on this, but as part of the, the research on ADHD, Abby found out she had ADHD. So we were getting all the insight of that. And um, as we mentioned there this morning, one of the things about um, ADHD, and we talked about developing services. Well, we actually have the person in Ireland who's actually here for delivering the services in ADHD. And, um, and after Abby, we'll be following that with Dr. Margaret Wrigley, who is the clinical director with the HSE for adult services here in Ireland. So uh, it's a, a packed afternoon coming for the next hour or so. So we hope you find it enjoyable. And uh, at this stage, I'll hand over to Abby. Hi everyone, my name is Abby and thanks to Ken and everyone at ADHD Ireland for having me again today. I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit about, spoiler, my ADHD journey and also a little bit about the research that I'm doing in a adult ADHD as well. So I suppose a little bit of background about me. My name is Abby, I am 26, uh, my pronouns are she, her, I identify as a woman. Um, I have a bachelor's and a master's in psychology, um, and I'm currently in my second year of a psychology PhD in Dublin City University. And I've been so blessed to be working with ADHD Ireland and the Irish Research Council uh, to be funded to be able to do that. I suppose the most important thing about me, given that we are at an ADHD talk, we're learning an awful lot about adult ADHD, that yes, I am in fact a Libra. I know that was all uh, the burning question on all of your tongues. So I'm glad we got that out of the way. But I suppose the actual most important thing is that yes, I was diagnosed with inattentive ADHD in May 2023. So that was quite recent. It's still something that's quite new to me, it's something that I'm still learning about. So I'll kind of be taking you through how that journey has been for me, I suppose. To catch you up to speed, um, I will be starting about when it kind of started trickling into my head that maybe ADHD was what was going on with me. But I suppose what happened before that was I was misdiagnosed with borderline personality disorder. I'd constantly sort of since my early teens struggled with anxiety, depression, and that never really made a whole lot of sense until May 2023 when I received that diagnosis. So. When we go on to my little journey a bit, I'm going to sort of start out with how my PhD started within my first year, how the thoughts that I may have ADHD became sort of trickling into my head. So it was September 2022. I had just finished up a gap year. I was ready to start my PhD and I was so excited for this new beginning. Um, I had just finished my bachelor's, finished my master's, had a year off working and I just felt so positive, excited to see 
what was going to be ahead of me and just grateful to have all these opportunities to be working with these really, really fantastic organizations. And then October 2022 came and I was like, wow, PhDs have such a heavy workload. I'm finding it really hard to know where to start. I'm just finding my feet. I've gone from a top master's into a research PhD. It's all more independent. I've finally been able to set foot in DCU after um, all of uh, isolation and restrictions sort of let up. So I was like, I need to find my way around. I need to make friends. I've started teaching. It's quite difficult. It's a big change. So I was still feeling that positivity, giving myself that good bit of leeway and then November 2022 came and I was like why won't this writer's block go away I was going into my supervisor every week like no I still haven't written anything I'm still not quite sure what's happening maybe it's I'm just struggling to get settled I'm not used to this independence what I I'm not sure what's going on but I'm sure I'll just settle down I'll get used to it and by December 2022, and Christmas came along, I was absolutely exhausted from just thinking about all the things I had to do. Not that I had actually done them, but just that they were piling up. It was all on my shoulders, and I did not know how to prioritize anything, how to go about any of that. So January came and I was like, you know what? New year, new me. I was just settling in. I needed those few months. It was a big, huge change. And now it's going to be time to focus. I got the timetables. I got the diaries. I got the planners. I was ready to go. I'm feeling great about it. But then February came and I was like, actually, January might have been a little, be a little bit too soon to be motivated. So Oh, have I frozen? We're all right. <laughs> January might be a little too soon to be motivated. February is my time to shine. You know, we were just over the Christmas. I was getting over a break. It was hard to get back into things. But February, we can do it. Everything's fine. And then March came along and it started to get harder to just think of this, these difficulties as I'm just settling in. It was, I was nearly done a year of my PhD and I felt like I had gotten absolutely nowhere. And that positivity was completely gone. It was just all negativity. What is wrong with me? Why can't I get any work done? Why do I keep getting distracted? I just did not feel able for that PhD, no matter if my parents told me or my supervisors or my lecturers told me, I did not feel good good enough and I just felt like I was going to let absolutely everybody down so from the outside no one knew this but this was exactly what my head looked like every single day so it was very much demands of just do something just focus just read an article things that in my head I was like these are easy things to do you know you have to do them so why can't you just get up get out of bed and do them and I was like why can't I do a deadline I was making excuses like I'll start tomorrow knowing that I absolutely wouldn't I was like why can't I stick to a plan and the main thought behind all of these was I need to drop out. I need to drop out. I need to drop out. I am not able to do any of this. And there was just a huge contrast from September 2022 up until March 2023. So that picture was taken from my first day in DCU and I was so excited to get started. I couldn't wait to meet everyone in the office. I couldn't wait to start working um, and learning more about ADHD and getting back into research that I had missed over the course of that gap year I took. But by March 2023, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't leave my room. I knew everything that I had to do. And those thoughts were just all consuming. And I was just exhausted because every night I would go to sleep and I'd be like, tomorrow is going to be different. Tomorrow I'll get up. I have a plan. I'm going to be able to do everything. And then I would wake up the next day and just be like, I can't do it. I Why can't I get out of bed? And why can't I move? And it was just... It was so exhausting to live with and absolutely no one knew because all of this was happening so internally. Like I'd find myself lying to my family. They'd be like, how are you getting on in your PhD? I'd be like, absolutely smashing it. I'm just working from home today. Gonna go back upstairs, hop back on the computer. We're gonna learn loads. 
And that wasn't the case at all. Um, I would have a meeting every week and I'd be, how are you getting on? Um, and I go, yeah, absolutely fine, working away. Whereas all the other days of the week, I was at home just totally paralyzed by these thoughts of that I cannot do this. So this is what I eventually learned to be task paralysis. And I love this image because this is exactly how I felt every single day from September all the way up to March. And it was just like this dog in the picture. I need to put this fire out. I need to put this fire out. I need to put this fire out. Why am I not doing anything? So I knew everything on that list that I had to do to be able to get through this PhD. And my body and my brain just would not let me do it. But from the outside, if you're looking at this dog, you're like, wow, he's totally chill. He's fine. He's he's doing fine with all the fire. So uh, that is pretty much a great illustration of how I felt every single day during that. So... At seven months in, this was kind of where I was at. So I went from feeling so optimistic, so hopeful for the future to just constantly worried, feeling hopeless. I had such poor time planning. I had no motivation or no self-esteem whatsoever. All that self-belief I had at the start was totally gone. I had no ability to focus. And every day of my life was just the same because I was just totally blinded by task paralysis. So it got to the point in April where I was like, I can't do this anymore. I I can't just sit with this task paralysis every day. I can't sit with these thoughts that are absolutely exhausting me every day. And I was like, I need to, at this point, make a decision. So I knew I had two options. And the first one, the one that my head was screaming at me every single day, was I drop out of the PhD program. And that was the option my head wanted to take. And that seemed to be the easiest option. But then I was also blinded by... I don't want to let everyone down. Everyone's going to be so disappointed. People, my supervisor, my family, ADHD Ireland have all stuck out their necks for me. And I'm just going to let everyone down because of this, because I feel lazy or I just don't have it in me to be able to do this program. And the second option was that I advocate for myself and get the help I need to continue. And that was a really scary prospect for me because advocating for yourself is never an easy task. It's always something that you have to really build up the courage to be able to do. And because I was at breaking point, I knew that that had to be an option for me. So Thankfully, I did choose option two. So I decided to advocate for myself. Um, the pathway to that wasn't the easiest either. I, you know, went to my psychiatrist. I went um, with a list of why maybe I don't have borderline personality disorder and why maybe this overlap and my lack of focus and lack of motivation might be due to ADHD instead. And I was sort of met with well, that's not, you know, what we cover here. So you might have to go private for that. And that was another sort of barrier in the way of that advocating for myself. So when choosing that option, I was questioning my thoughts and behaviors. I was like, maybe because this has gone on for so many months, it might be more than just an adjustment to PhD life. And every sort of week with my supervisors when we were having a meeting and we were talking about um, ADHD and uh, ADHD in adults and how that might um, uh, how, how the presentation of that might be. I was sort of sitting in on these conversations and I was going, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But in my head, I was like, oh, my God, this is like they've just been watching me and they've been just seeing everything that I have been experiencing. So I was like, maybe this isn't relevant to just research, but also to myself. So following all of that, that is how I received an ADHD diagnosis and after that, I thought it would just be the end. And I was like, I will just get my meds. I, I know the answers to things now. That's it. Okay, great. Problem solved. It was not the end at all. 
What I thought was going to happen in my life after receiving my ADHD diagnosis was first that all of this depressed mood I was feeling, all of these self-esteem issues, all of the, I can't do this, I'm not able for this. I thought I would just go from sad to happy. And I thought I would go from a PhD student who can't even read an article or can't even get past writer's block. I thought I would go all the way up to world's greatest student and my productivity would absolutely skyrocket. And also the biggest thing for me that I was really hoping for that I would finally be able to fold and hang up my washing after taking it out of the tumble dryer. And Needless to say, these all did not happen automatically. <laughs> so what actually happened after my diagnosis was having to continue to gather the strength to reach out for support, which was really, really difficult. It was difficult for me all the way through my teens, difficult for me in my adulthood, and then to continue to have these answers and to continue to reach out for support. So with the ADHD Ireland services is signing up to get um, disability support in college to be able to access occupational therapy. It was me constantly going, oh, another hurdle and that is something that's really hard for someone who struggles with switching tasks who struggles with task paralysis that's something really really hard to do to go okay well even though I did this really big thing and I advocated for myself I still haven't reached that final hurdle and this is something that I'm gonna have to continue to do um, I also was dealing with a sort of sense of loss of who I could have been with an earlier diagnosis. So I was sort of thinking back to my teenage years and thinking maybe I wouldn't have struggled so hard with my self-esteem. Maybe I wouldn't have felt I'd so depressed during a lot of my teenage years if this was what I knew was sort of going on internally for me. Um, I will have been identifying the negative ways that I've coped with my symptoms while living undiagnosed. So I was 25 when I got diagnosed. So that was 25 years of maladaptively coping with the symptoms um, that I was experiencing that I didn't even know were anything to do with ADHD. So it was coming to terms of identifying how I usually operate and going, oh, maybe that's not the best way to do things. And also I started sort of discovering parts of myself then that I had masked. So I had this answer of, oh, it is ADHD. And I was thinking back to, oh, my self-esteem and sometimes growing all the way up from, I'd say, 13 years old all the way up to about 24. Speaking in conversations was something I wouldn't be able to do. Sitting up here, doing a presentation for a group of people was not something I'd be able to do because I just muted myself because I was so afraid of, you know, what I was going to say or how people were going to perceive me because there was probably always that underlying fear of, oh, maybe my brain doesn't work exactly like how all my peers' brains work. And I've been discovering a lot more about myself. I've been a lot more extroverted since. Um, I've been a lot kinder to myself in that if I need to move around or if I need to get up out of a seat in a meeting because I feel restless inside, I can understand that about myself. I'll allow myself to do that. Whereas before it would just be me thinking, what are you doing? Why can't you do this when everyone else can? Um, there was also coming to terms with living in a world that wasn't made to facilitate how my brain operates. So I love working on a deadline schedule and my brain loves even when the nighttime hits. I'm like, that's my deadline. I'll start working later in the day. But when you're going to work and everyone's on a nine to five schedule, that isn't something that is going to work for you if your brain doesn't start going, oh, we need to get things done until about three in the day. So it's really sort of hard to navigate those things when you are living with ADHD as well. Um, I had a load of financial issues as well due to diagnosis. I had um, medication costs. I had to go private for my diagnosis. Um, I still can't drive now because I had to spend my driving lesson money on that. So it's a lot of things that people who are neurotypical 
don't have to think about and a lot of costs that you have to incur if you do want to go after a diagnosis. So that was a really big thinking point for me. Um, skill regression as well is something I've also experienced. So now that I understand my behavior, I'm kind of looking at, oh, well, what would be a better way to do that? But due to that, I'm suddenly not able to do the things that I always sort of maladaptively cope to be able to do. So, you know, deadlines aren't working as well for me anymore, or I'm late to things when usually I'd always be 15 minutes early because I'd have that um, sort of deadline there for myself. So I'm trying to find the balance between that lenience and understanding and learning to um cope better without reaching that burnout that I would have reached before and then also just feelings of doubt and did I really have ADHD because as it's sort of growing more in the media and I'm learning more with my research I'm learning what ADHD looks like but there's always that stereotype of you know the hyperactive kid who's running around and I was like oh well if I didn't meet that maybe I've just made it all up in my head maybe I just am not cut out for this PhD and it's really hard to stop those doubts coming back into my head as well there's also the struggling to tell people. Um, I really struggled to tell my family. I told my dad first. I was terrified to tell my mom. Um, I didn't want my parents feeling like this was something they missed in childhood or they could have done something more for me when a lot of it, like we talked about earlier, was so internal that no one on the surface would have realized about it. Um, and I had those sort of feelings of guilt. I told my dad first, he told my mom for me because I was so scared and everything was fine, but it was hard to navigate those feelings within me. Um, there's still a lot of ADHD stigma out there as well. You know, you don't want people to think you're just lazy or if you have to do things a certain way, oh, she always has to be difficult. So it's hard to navigate that while advocating for yourself of what you need, while also not feeling like a burden to other people too. And then I suppose just aligning my self-perception to my research perception as well. So there's some days when I'm learning about ADHD and I can almost feel the lack of dopamine in my brain because I've read into it so much. So there's that's quite a unique circumstance for me, I suppose, but it is something I also have been dealing with in that how much do I read? How in-depth to my brain do I go? How do I keep my research separate from my sense of self? And that has been something that I've been navigating. Um, and I suppose looking at all of that and looking at what the actual outcomes of my diagnosis were, um, I really turned to reevaluating the past. And this especially played into, you know, am I making everything up or what was the ADHD and what was like my true self? And I had a lot of, you know, grief and conflicting feelings about that. So looking back at my past oh I did a master's and I did a bachelor's um but I was writing all my essays the night before but I was doing well so where how did that all make sense maybe it was just me and I like operating with deadlines or I like being late or is that me at all or is that was that the undiagnosed ADHD and it was a lot of that sort of trying to get that balance in my head and what I've sort of landed on with this is that it doesn't have to be either. It doesn't have to be, this is my ADHD and this is the real me because both of those things have molded me into the person I am today. Learning that I do have ADHD has also given me a load of skills that I probably wouldn't have without living with undiagnosed ADHD. There was one um, point that I read recently that really stuck out to me that was, you know, difficulty comes in prioritizing tasks and organizing the order you need to do things because all of your thoughts have that same level of importance and one of my favorite things about myself is that I'm a really good mediator I'm really good at seeing two sides to every story so I'm re I really like that all my thoughts have the same level of importance because it's something that I really really value about myself my friends value it about me and there is a ton of other characteristics that I do have that I can definitely 
equate to ADHD and definitely equate to that is who I am as a person. And I'm trying to find that really nice balance in between that where I can live peacefully without that self-doubt, without that sort of questioning of the what ifs. And I think that's a point that is really important to reach and really important to be kind to yourself about it too. So like I said, I am in a little bit of a unique position regarding I am currently learning about ADHD uh, with my PhD research. And I'm also in that position where I'm trying to balance the fact that some a lot of this research might apply to myself as well. So I'm learning a lot about me and the ADHD, uh, the adult ADHD population as a whole. So just to give you a little bit of background about the research, um, I'm looking at ADHD and decision making and us ADHDers love a decision in a sense in that we love getting absolutely absorbed in all of the options dealing with analysis paralysis maybe um careless mistakes some poor organization um working memory um issues where you mightn't think of all the details or recall all of them before jumping into the decision impulsively or getting distracted midway through making your decision and two months go by and you go oh my god yes i was supposed to decide that so that is something that is really important adult ADHD as a whole isn't looked at a lot in the research um, and especially decision making I think it's a really really interesting point um, that we do need to delve into further um, what I'm looking at specifically is perceptual decision making. So these are the decisions that are frequent choices that we have to make in everyday life. So when we think of a decision we think of you know the decision to get married or the decision to have a baby or the decision to start a new job. But these perceptual decisions are just those little decisions that you have every day. So it could be that you're driving down a street, you come up to a traffic light, it's turned orange. Do you speed up to try and get through it? Do you hit the brakes to slow down? And it's those decisions that need to be made very quickly by taking in everything that's going on in your environment. So it seems like an easy enough decision if you're on a quiet road you see you know no cars are there there's no one on the footpaths that decision will be easy to make but that decision might get harder if, if there's other cars on the road if there's people crossing a street if you see a police car or an ambulance coming up behind you and suddenly you have all of these different um uh different sort of distractions coming that might help you form your decision so I've concocted a little bit of a story to show you how people with ADHD or more, more specifically myself might have to make these perceptual decisions. So if it's 4.45 and a bank closes at 5 p.m. on a weekday and I need to get to that bank, I've just had a little bit of windfall. I need to get that money straight into the bank or I am going to completely forget about it. So I'm coming up to a crosswalk. My decision needs to be taking in, is there anything on the road? Where is the crosswalk? Need to cross and get to the bank. Simple enough. What if we add in a little bit more? So there's cars on the street now. So now I'm thinking, does the driver see me? Am I able to cross the road? Do I have enough time to do that? Is there going to be a gap in the car? And that adds another sort of layer to my decision making. And then there's ducks crossing the street in this decision. So I whip out my phone. I'm like, oh my God, aren't they absolutely adorable? Need to post this on Instagram. Wait, 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 wait. No, I need to go to the bank. I need to get this money in. Windfall, windfall, windfall. So I'm like, okay, perfect. But then I look up and I notice that it's raining. And I'm like, oh God, I just put out some clothes on the line. I need to go back home and do that. No, oh my God, no, come back, the bank. But now there's puddles on the road. I need to factor them into my decision as well. Don't want to get my new suede boots wet. So I'm thinking about the cars, the rain, the ducks, the puddles, and the bank closing at five o'clock. I forget that the marching band is in town that day. But they're playing a Taylor Swift medley, so I get distracted a bit and have a little dance break. And then I'm like, oh my God, the bank. 
And as I cross the road, I'm distracted that it's hit five o'clock. I've stepped in a puddle and um, there's still cars in the way. The bank's closed. My money's still in my pocket. It's the weekend. Can't get back to Monday. By the time Monday hits, it's out of my head. And these are all different things that could play into um, play into your decision when you are making those perceptual decisions. So the more that's going on around you, the more likely you are you could make an error or um, you might be miss your decision entirely like I did in this scenario. So essentially what we're going to be looking at in the research is how do these perceptual decisions affect adults with ADHD? And we're lo still looking for participants. I know some of you on this Zoom are from Ireland. Some of you might be from even further abroad. And if anyone it does have the means to come up to DCU or do the Zoom interview, we'd absolutely love to have you. So anyone 18 to 50 years with or without ADHD, all are welcome. And yeah, that was my journey through ADHD, getting an ADHD diagnosis while doing a PhD and a little bit about the research that I am doing as well. So thank you for sticking around and listening to that. I just want to say thanks to Abby for that talk. Abby was talking there about getting the process. Um, when I started in this role seven years ago, um, one of the first things I did was, was contacted Dr. Margaret Wrigley in HSE because she was the person in charge of getting the system together. Um, we've made large strides in those uh, last five to seven years. Um, there wasn't anything seven years ago, but um, delighted Margo is now going to join us um, and give us a, an overview of how you go and develop a system when you start from absolutely scratch. Hello everyone and uh, it's a very great pleasure to be invited here and actually it takes me back a journey of 30 years ago to 1993 when I met colleagues um, from Greece and Cyprus as part of a European initiative but at that time I was an old age psychiatrist and we were trying to develop psychiatry of old age services so um, and we had lovely Greek music as well as I recall so it was lovely. Um, so I've morphed into someone who's very interested in ADHD. And uh, just a bit of background about that before um, I move on the, this first slide. Um, so my interest really um, developed when I was appointed to a role in the HSE, which is our public health service and uh, of National Clinical Advisor. And my role was to identify deficits in services within the public system in Ireland. So there are quite a few. But one of them I did identify was um, ADHD, specifically for adults, because children are responded to through the child and adolescent mental health services. But there was literally nothing for adults in the public system. Um, and I was aware of it because I had previously been managing the service in North Dublin. And we had a couple of people who'd come from America where they had been diagnosed and uh, we're looking to continue treatment and uh, I nothing really here for them. So I was aware there was that deficit. And um, in addition, like many of us who work in uh, the area of ADHD clinically, I had a daughter um, who'd been diagnosed um, with ADHD. She was actually misdiagnosed, but, and she is, allows me to say this, misdiagnosed initially as having dyslexia at the age of seven. And around that time, a couple of years later, the um, I should say the Harry Potter books, you're familiar with Harry Potter, came out. And suddenly there was a miraculous cure of her dyslexia because she wanted to read Harry Potter but hadn't <laughs> wanted to read anything else. So I actually went to the psychologist and said, I don't think that's right. You know, what about ADHD? Um, and she was diagnosed then. Um, so that's um, how I come... Uh, to ADHD from two directions, as it were. So uh, at the time, we had a mental health division in our public health service, and they agreed um, eventually that they would prioritise um, provision of services for adults with ADHD, and they sanctioned the setting up of a national uh, clinical programme, which is how within our service, we, um, our public services, we develop new services. So... Um, I was appointed the clinical lead for that program and I also had a half-time program manager working with me. And with the mental health division, we agreed the terms of reference and I was asked to establish a working group 
and of particular relevance, I think, because the person had a huge impact was I then contacted Ken, um, who had started in Rome that year, I think, wasn't it, to ask um, if ADHD Ireland would nominate someone uh, to join the working group. And um, the person who was nominated, Kate Carp Fanning, Dr. Kate Carp Fanning is actually someone who has ADHD and she had a very uh, major impact on the model of care that we developed. It took a couple of years to develop it um, and it was approved by the person who would replaced me as National Clinical Advisor. It was looked at by our college um, and I must stress um, that within our College of Psychiatrists, um, that there is a requirement that child and adolescent psychiatrists and learning disability psychiatrists uh, train um, to assess and diagnose ADHD, but not in adult psychiatry or in my own field of old age psychiatry. Um, so, um, so that was slightly complicated, but it was um, eventually approved by the HSE Clinical Design and Innovation as a project that could move on to implementation provided we got funding for it, and uh, therein lies the story. Um, so we had funding and it was taken away and, and eventually came back again, uh, some of it. So the model of care, just to give you an outline of it, um, our target really is um, adults, i.e. 18 plus um, with ADHD, by which I mean that they have two of the three core symptoms of ADHD, and have impairment in two or more areas of function. And these are the DSM criteria, which uh, some of you will be familiar with. Um, the, the model um, was based on providing a thorough assessment, um, which includes the usual mental state examination history, um, but using the DIVA-5 um, assessment, and also getting a collateral history from someone, hopefully who knows the person from childhood, because you need the uh, symptoms to be present in childhood to make the diagnosis. Um, if the diagnosis is confirmed, there's then a discussion with the person, as recommended in the model of care, about what sort of uh, treatment might be appropriate. And it's um, a discussion of consent. So, you know, some people want this, other people want that. Um, but the sort of range of treatment is ADHD specific medication, psychoeducation, which really is, applies for everyone, the psychoeducation, and then an OT or psychology intervention um, in, in group format. And that's in line with the NICE guidelines, which we are not obliged to follow in Ireland, but we do consider them to be good practice, specifically in ADHD. Um, to deliver this, um, we recommended the setting up of services um, based on a multidisciplinary team. So a consultant psychiatrist, specifically an adult psychiatrist, a senior occupational therapist, senior psychologist, um, a clinical nurse specialist in mental health and an administrator, because obviously they're often key people, invariably key people in services, um, and often the first po person uh, people who are attending a service will contact. Um, we researched extensively um, models um, out there of how to deliver services, and this is pre-pandemic, I, I stress to you. Um, and... Um, we looked at some in Europe. Um, mostly we looked in the UK because we have very similar health systems um, in, in, to those in the UK. And eventually we thought that the most sustainable one and the one that um, seemed to meet our needs best was a combination of a secondary and tertiary care service, which I'll go into now. Um, so the clinical pathway um, for adults with ADHD coming to access the service um, would be that they could be um, an adult who had no previous diagnosis, or they may be an adult who had been diagnosed as a child um, but had no further contact. Um, so they are referred, uh, that person is referred by their GP, um, and they're referred initially to the adult mental health team. And the rationale for that originally was that um, the descriptions that were coming about was that lots of people had significant uh, comorbid mental illness and would require, would benefit from identification and treatment of that prior to going on to the ADHD service. Um, 
So then they go to the ADHD service with the assessment that I've outlined briefly to you. They have the interventions and if they're on medication and they're stabilized on medication, um, they've had their group intervention um, and uh, they're then discharged to their GP. And if they're on medication, the GP is asked to continue to prescribe that medication. Um, and um, they're then recalled to the service on a, an annual basis for a review of their medication. Uh, two questions, really. One, do they still need the medication? And two, is it at the right dose? Um, and that, again, is in line with the NICE guidelines. For people, um, young people who've been attending CAMS, um, we uh, recommended a modified pathway um, in that um, the adult mental health team and the relevant catchment area adult mental health team and the um, ADHD service would con consider um, the information sent uh, to them by the CAM service. And if it seemed as though it was a more complex set of problems with comorbid mental illness, they'd be seen by the adult team. If the main problems seemed to be ADHD, they'd come to the ADHD service. So they didn't have to uh, go through adult invariably. So, uh, and then um, when they come to the ADHD, it's the same sort of format as I've described to you. So uh, within Ireland, we have uh, 26 counties and um, we looked, uh, based on that, we looked at a national distribution of clinics and that was allied to populations of working age adults. And this came at that time to a total of nine catchment area based clinics in, uh, sorry, 11. Nine of those, the staff would be full time because of the population. And in two of them that had uh, quite small populations, the staff would be half time. And we also recommended a team that would work alongside the forensic psychiatry in reach services to the Dublin prisons. That's where most of our prisons are, so they could advise um, the prisons um, on the uh, identification and treatment of ADHD. So um, the next step uh, following the model of care and its approval by the HSE itself um, was that Minister Butler, who is still our um, Minister for Mental Health, she's a junior minister within the Department of Health, so she reports into the main minister. Um, she launched um, the model of care for us in 2021. And at that time, she allocated 1.3 million euro. And that allowed us to uh, make a start on setting up three pilot sites. So um, the program within our clinical programs, in, instead of just sort of writing a model of care and then uh, leaving it on a shelf, as it were, um, within mental health, the clinical um, lead and program manager continue to uh, have a role in implementing the program, um, depending on what it is. Um, and um, what we did then was, um, so we assisted the local services in recruiting the staff for the three pilot sites. Um, we also assisted them, encouraged them perhaps in identifying suitable accommodation for the team to work out of. And um, we organised, we funded and organised training for all the newly recruited staff. And we do that through UCAN. I presume you have, you use UCAN as well, do you? Uh, it's the United Kingdom Adult ADHD Network, and they provide... Um, they provide a lot of uh, training um, for um, not just the UK and us, but also now since they're doing it online to Australia, New Zealand and wherever you are. Um, so um, they're very highly regarded. So the progress then to um, moving into 2022 and into last year, we established the three pilot sites and I've uh, listed there the counties that they cover within Ireland. Um, we started to collect activity data on a monthly basis from each service. And we also set up a national oversight and implementation group, which I chair, and it meets two monthly um, with um, uh, nominees from each of the uh, services. 
And the function of that really is to support all of the new adult ADHD services because it can be very difficult, as you know, to uh, set up something new in an area, um, particularly where you know, there is amongst uh, some colleagues in all professions scepticism about whether ADHD actually exists in adults. So um, we also are the National Clinical Advisor at that time, who is still Dr. Amir Niazi. He also commissioned UCD School of Psychology to evaluate the three pilot sites, and the results are coming through on that. Um, then subsequently, um, we were allocated... Um, Funding. The first lot of funding came in 2021, so we started building up the services. Then we got allocated more funding in 2022 to set up four more services. So we started in again and recruiting uh, for the four new services, training the new teams, identifying accommodation and so on. So the current position is that seven of the 12 uh, recommended teams within the programme have been funded by Minister Butler, and she, I have to say, has been a huge support to us. Um, five of them are fully operational, um, and I've listed where they are, um, and I'll be saying a little bit more about what has happened to them in the intervening time. One is partially operational, and that's the second one in Dublin, and that's because there's been a a, year, a delay in um, providing accommodation for the team to work out of. And uh, since April this year, it um, can be difficult to recruit consultants in Ireland. Um, I don't know if it's the same in Greece and Cyprus, but anyway, we do actually have a Greek consultant who heads up the uh, Sligo Leitrim Donegal, um, Demetrius Adamus, if any of you have heard of him, who's a wonderful ally really, isn't he? Yeah. Um, but anyway, we have recruited um, eventually our consultant for the seventh team, which is going to cover the Midlands, Kildare and West Wicklow. And um, we're now actively working with that team uh, to get it up and running. So um, the other aspects of the work of the programme are um, a tripartite collaboration. And this is something I find wonderfully rewarding because um, it can be difficult setting up the services. So that's with uh, ADHD Ireland and the UCD uh, School of Psychology. And we have focused really on two aspects. One is looking at research, specifically Irish research, um, because it's not a huge amount um, in the Irish population, and also to look at intervention. So I've listed here some of the work that we've done. So we've looked at suicidality, and repeated self-harm in people with ADHD in this country. Um, we've just completed um, a review of the clinical and disability support services for students with ADHD at third level. Um, and that included sort of the survey of what's available and then also um, getting information from uh, students with a a ADHD that they provided for us. So there's kind of two bits to that. Um, we've looked at ADHD in women in Ireland. Uh, we were funded for that by the National Women's Task Force. And um, that's been very interesting. You heard some of that, didn't you, Abby, when we presented it for the International Women's Day in DCU. Um, and at uh, Ken's special request, we looked at the socioeconomic impact of untreated ADHD in Ireland. And uh, that's uh, been written up at the moment. Interventions, we've developed two. One is an app, um, so an Irish app for adults with ADHD, and uh, that's had in excess of 15,000 downloads, um, so that seem to be reaching people. And the second intervention is UMAP, which is the Understanding and Managing Adult uh, ADHD in Adults program. And um, this um, is... Uh, is Work, a workshop format. It's online. Um, there are six sessions. And um, following the sort of pilot, we recruited a senior psychologist who herself has ADHD, because that was the feedback we got from the pilot that it would make it that much more valuable. And then there are two people who work with her as facilitators. Um, so that has been uh, delivered um, and refined um, since the middle of June. Uh, all of last year, and I'm pleased to say it's ongoing this year because the Minister Butler 
um, has um, allocated recurrent annual funding to ADHD Ireland of 1.42 million. So we can keep going. And um, to give you an idea of the numbers who have gone through in excess of uh, 1,500 people have fully attended the programme. And I'm a long time working in in mental health services, and I have never seen such positive affirmation uh, for a programme at all. And we're now looking at perhaps developing a training course for other people because um, to deliver the programme in other areas and perhaps refining it for delivery in the third level sector as well. Uh, both of these have been evaluated uh, through our tripartite group and um, the UMAP uh, programme has uh, implemented the results of the evaluation and the app is in the process of doing so. And I would like to um, pay a special tribute to Christina Siri and Christine Boyle, two doctoral students working with UCD uh, in at UCD School of Psychology who've really carried out outstanding uh, work supervised by Jessica and Ken and I doing our best as well. So, um, so um, moving on, the other aspect of work that I've been looking at is that, as I'm sure you all know, um, neurodiverse conditions uh, tend to travel um, together. So it's not unusual uh, to have ADHD and uh, yeah, it's probably about 30% of people with ADHD are also autistic and the reverse is true. Um, and there are other conditions that are very common uh, as well. So you have uh, um, dyspraxia um, or what they call a developmental coordination disorder now, uh, communication disorders, apraxia of language, specific learning disorders such as dyslexia and dyscalculia all come under the rubric of um, neurodiversity, but often people, um, some d just have their own particular diagnosis, um, but other people will have a couple of issues. And uh, it's important um, that the person is recognized as having those because it can change, um, or it can mean that, you know, that they would have a formal assessment for that and might need additional interventions for that. Um, so um, what, I, what I was proposing to the our primary care and disability services within, within the HSE that it might be useful to look at providing something like a neurodisability, um, a neurodiversity hub, so that, you know, there's a sort of a one-stop shop approach and whether you're a child or an adult, um, you access um, the one spot and if you have... ADHD, you have a pathway. If you're autistic, you have a pathway. If it seems as though you may also be dyspraxic, um, there's a pathway perhaps to an OT as well to, for assessment. So that's um, something to be considered. Um, uh, and um, I am uh, trying to um, propose it in, uh, to anyone who will listen to it because I do think it would be a good way to develop services at primary care level. Um, significant events then, um, stories are never straightforward. Um, and last year, the two significant events um, were that we were finding that the numbers who uh, were being referred um, to our five fully operational services were far in excess of the numbers predicted. That might be the experience you have as well. And in addition, uh, within the HSE, this happens periodically within our service, but in the last quarter, the new director general decided that he would impose a staff recruitment embargo for all staff except for consultants. And um, that's for all new posts and for any vacant existing posts. And that did have quite an impact on the services. It made it difficult for us to continue developing the two new services that we had more work to do with and where vacancies had arisen in the five fully operational services, we couldn't fill them. So um, in that context, I, um, I, uh, we have this system of risk and identification and escalation. So I escalated that to Amir, who's uh, the National Clinical Advisor and said, look, this is in December. And I said, look, 
you know, the, the whole thing is going to collapse unless we look at how we are going to address this. Um, so that leads me on to the next slide, um, which is um, I proposed to him based on um, the review of five fully operational services and what was happening internationally that we consider establishing an integrate, integrated care project for adults with ADHD. So of relevance to this are the high number of referrals post-pandemic post with waiting lists within our existing services of up, of up to four years in December, and they've grown obviously since then. And this reflects the lack of public service availability, which Abby has described to you um, until recent times. Um, and, and that means that we have a backlog accruing over many years of people who should have been going for that assessment and weren't. Um, and in addition, we have an absence of a primary care uh, response for people with ADHD. And the same is true for adults with autism, to give you a, a notion of that too. Um, and the impact of the pandemic um, is interesting um, and overwhelming simultaneously. But what we found is that looking at the people who were being referred is that it's almost as though another group of people were being uncovered by the pandemic. Um, and it is to do with, we think, um, the fact that a lot of people who have ADHD uh, seem to be able to manage with this external scaffolding of work and in, and for, for some in the university setting as well. But with the pandemic and having to work at home, that external scaffolding went and it was very hard for people to organise themselves to work at home or to study at home. And for other people like uh, those who are in the hospitality sector or those who were working in building where there was just complete cessation of activity they were at home and they found that very stressful as well and this was coupled with an increase in public awareness about ADHD um, and I think the other interesting aspect is that's now very evident is that there is an emerging um acknowledgement, in fact, a full acknowledgement, I would say at this stage, that women are often missed as girls. And again, you described that very well, uh, uh, Abby, in that um, girls are more likely to present with an inattentive type of ADHD. So they're the quiet girl looking out the window, dreaming, it doesn't cause any hassle. Everyone leaves her alone and the boys are jumping around. So they get seen, they get diagnosed. The girls don't. And then as young women, when they're put into situations, particularly if they leave home, uh, maybe going to college, um, and there is the need to look after. Mothers are uh, a scaffolders, you know, in terms of just do your homework, just do your work, I'll do everything else. And then suddenly you leave home and you've got to look after your washing you know, hanging up of clothes, um, looking after buying food, eating properly, etc. In addition with being in a different setting. And um, whilst some people with ADHD find the structure of college manageable, there are others who find it very difficult um, because of the need to be in lectures and attend. Uh, and I say this with my daughter in mind because she found it absolutely horrendous and couldn't do it um, at all. Um, so um, so women are now emerging. And of course, I suppose um, I was also, Ken knows the clinical lead for developing specialist perinatal mental health services in this country. So I'm very conscious of the challenges of motherhood for women with ADHD. So you know, if you're someone who has executive dysfunction and you find it hard to organize yourself, suddenly you have a baby and, and babies need routine. So you can imagine the scenario there. So um, that's something that we're also considering within our tripartite group as well. Um, so 
The other aspect is um, more to do with the pathway that we recommended, which is that people would go through adult mental health. Um, but the evidence of that from um, the services that we have set up is that, in fact, most people don't have significant comorbid mental illness, number one, so they don't need to go there. And number two, the numbers are so overwhelming that it's posing an unreasonable burden on adult mental health teams. So that's something we're considering changing. So that's the integrated care project that I proposed to Amir. And uh, Ken, as always, he uh, agreed to work with us in um, setting up a joint project with ADHD Ireland and um, funding was allocated through the HSE to employ um, a consultant psychiatrist for one day per week for one year through ADHD Ireland, who's working with me now on this project. And uh, Michelle also, as well as having the distinction of having established new services in a university setting in Cork and also a HSE service in Cork, um, has the... Um, also has the gold standard of having ADHD herself diagnosed about five years ago. So has a particular insight that's really very useful for us. So um, just ending by telling you a little bit about the stages of this project. First, um, we started in mid-February, so we're consulting with all relevant stakeholders. Um, and that's... Um, uh, that's a very wide range, I, 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 so too long for me to list, but I'm happy to tell you who we've been consulted with, if you like. And uh, concurrent with this uh, literature review, which is ongoing, um, where to, oh, I should say the consultation, um, we're also having a consultation meeting, bringing those stakeholders and other parties together. And that's taking place the day after tomorrow, <laughs> busy week. Um, and then um, uh, following that, then um, we, um, Michelle and I have to have a preliminary draft report ready for consideration by Amir and Ken. And that will then go out for to the relevant stakeholders for feedback. And we're to have a final report ready for early February. Um, so um, that's it. Um, just to give you some preliminary findings, um, ADHD Ireland kindly set up five focus groups uh, for us, looking at uh, adults under 25, over 25, those with um, comorbid who are also autistic, except parents and et cetera, and, and women with ADHD, they were the five groups. And really the take home message was universal um, from these uh, five groups. First of all, it was a formal diagnosis is really important. Um, so, you know, self-identification doesn't meet the needs of people with ADHD. They find it really invaluable to get um, a diagnosis. It helps put things in perspective and, it and you know, there's often a sort of a preliminary stage of that's answering my problems, followed by a bereavement of if it had been identified earlier, what could I have been like? But nevertheless, it is really important. The other thing that people were very strong about was they were keen to have the op option um, for medication, ADHD specific medication. And that leaves us with the challenge because it means that um, we don't we need both diagnosticians and prescribers um, at primary care level. So um, that's uh, something that we're considering strongly. The other plea or the other take home message from the focus groups was education of professionals at all levels. And people did talk about, you know, all I, without exception within the mental health services and outside the mental health services, including the acute hospital services, that they, while some professionals are really supportive, others can be very, um, very dismissive, feel it as though people are using this as a bit of an excuse. It's a made up thing. Anyone can say they have ADHD. Um, going into acute hospital, you may be on medication and the first uh, act of the profession of the doctor looking after you is to stop the medication without really consulting. Um, so, you know, that can cause huge problems as well. And um, the other bit sort of move, moving 
so we have so the the other points really to bring to your att attention um is that uh, we were looking at vertical uh, integration. So, you know, you have ADHD Ireland, you have this new primary care response, you have the teams we've set up. But there's also, and this is again from the focus groups, lots of people were saying, well, we have our ADHD assessment, but we think we might be autistic as well. Um, or the ADHD service said they thought we might be autistic and they did a screener um, for it. But where do we get that diagnosis? And um, that is, again, this sort of horizontal bit with the neurodiversity hub that I was talking about. And I've already highlighted to you that um, we, with the seventh service, we're now running a pilot to adjust the current pathway. Um, so it doesn't go through adult mental health, but it requires a lot of teasing out to do that. So we're in the process of doing that. So that's the link for the model of care if you'd like to have a look at it. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much to all our uh, speakers today. So we, um, you know, lots of great speakers there. There was Sophie earlier, Andrea, uh, Leonid is on the talk on biomarkers. Um, Abby telling us all about her life experience and how she's going to change the world in terms of all the research. <laughs> um, and Margot and how you build the system. So mm -hmm. just want to say thank you to everybody for all that.